Uh, tonight, uh, if you remember a few months ago, we were going through the book of Genesis. And we took a little hiatus. I think we're going to jump back into Genesis tonight. And we're going to pick up... Uh, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 28. We're going to back up a few verses from 28. If you remember, we've been going through the, the, uh, the book of Genesis and we have all the, all the messages on MP3. You can, most of them <laughs> are on the website. You can download them. And uh, we're going to be putting more on there as time goes on. But uh, just a little review, of course. Genesis, we started out in the beginning with God's creation. And uh, we started out with, you know, the fall. And after the fall, how men became wicked and God sent the flood. And God saved Noah and his family. And it was from them that all the nations and the races of the earth come uh, from. And as we, went, as we were going through the, the book of Genesis, we saw God narrowing down. He started out with like a big kind of wide range thing. He began narrowing it down. And he began talking about a fellow named Abram, who was the father, who we know became the father of the faithful. And a lot of time was given to Abram, who later, whose name later was changed to Abraham, and his family. Because God chose Abram, Abraham, to be the father of the, the people who would, through whom Messiah would come. The father of the people who would be a blessing to all the world. If you read the news today, a lot of people don't think they're a blessing to the world. In fact, the United Nations is just getting ready to, to take a vote, I think, to try to tell them what they have to do with their land. And that's, that's another story. But, but we talked about Abraham uh, and how God promised him a son and how he had a wife who was barren and how God provided. In spite of Abraham's attempt to do it himself, uh, God provided for him a son named Isaac, who was miraculously born, of course, in his old age, in Sarah's old age. Uh, Isaac became the son of promise, and he became a type of the sacrificial lamb. We know the story of when Abraham, God told Abraham to offer his son Isaac on Mount Moriah, and uh, he did. He did not argue, he did not reason, he did not try to you know, justify himself, but he uh, took his son up to the top of the mountain, and as he got ready to offer him as a sacrifice. God, of course, stopped his hand and provided, provided the ram for the sacrifice. Uh, the, the, New Test or, uh, the Old Testament, the Genesis, doesn't say a lot about Isaac. It tells us about uh, Isaac is the son of promise, and it gives a chapter or two. Uh, it talks about how he got his wife, Abraham sent Eliezer, his servant, to a distant land, back to Haran to get a wife for Isaac, and how that was a that was a, a, like a type of the Holy Spirit and so forth. And we talked about that. But it doesn't say a whole lot about Isaac. But it does begin to focus on Isaac's sons. Isaac had two sons. Uh, they were born at the same time. They were fraternal twins. Like me and Alade are <laughs> fraternal twins. They are born at the same time, but they don't look like each other. And uh, Esau and uh, Isaac, uh, Esau and Jacob didn't look like each other. And they didn't act like each other. Esau was a man of... The field, he was a man, you know, a man's man. He was a hunter, you know, you know he was a, a tough guy. And Jacob was kind of like a mama's boy, you know, he was, he was a homebody. And, uh, but yet, it was prophesied when, when uh, Rebecca, Isaac's wife, was pregnant, and the children were wrestling in her womb. It was prophesied that the younger would rule over the elder. And of course, Esau was born first, and... Uh, as he was coming out, Jacob had a hold of his heel. And uh, so they named him Jacob, which really means somebody that will trip someone up with it by grabbing their heel. A trickster is Jacob's name. Anyway, uh, so we read about that. In, in, in chapter 25, we read about the birth of these two brothers. <laughs> we read how Esau uh, was a very carnal man, but Jacob was a spiritual man. Even though Jacob was a rascal, he wasn't, he wasn't like a good little boy. He was, he, had a, he was spiritually minded. And I believe God knew that before they were born. He knew the personalities of the two boys that would be born. In chapter 25, if you remember, we read of how uh, uh, Jacob bought the birthright from Esau. Because Esau came back from hunting and he was hungry. And Jacob was there cooking, cooking a big bowl of soup. And uh, 
you know, Esau said, man, I'm starving. And give me some of that soup. And Jacob, being who he was, Jacob said, well, listen, I'll give you your soup if you sell me your birthright. And Esau, like a dummy, said, who needs the birthright? It showed, you know, where his mind was. He didn't, he didn't think about the promise that God had given to Abraham and to Isaac and so forth. He didn't think about it. He certainly had heard about it. But he didn't think about it. He was willing to give all that up just to feed his stomach. It was a picture of the carnal man, of course. Uh, in uh, chapter 26, we read that Esau, and again, the, his personality comes forth. Esau married Canaanite women. Now remember, uh, all through this whole series of stories, God emphasized the importance of the purity of the line, that it had to stay within the family. But Esau married outside of the family. He married Canaanite women. It was very displeasing to his parents and displeasing uh, to the Lord. In chapter 27, we read how Jacob stole the blessing. He uh, connived his father and stole the blessing by pretending to be Esau. He dressed like Esau. He put uh, goat's fur on his arm so his father would feel him, and uh, even though his father's eyes were going bad and he couldn't see. Uh, and he sounded, he, said, he sounded like Jacob, but you smell like Esau because he put all these, all these goat skins on him. So uh, he fooled his father into giving him the blessing. So we read all this and you think, this is Jacob, he's a character. I'm, I'm not sure if I was God, I don't know if I'd have picked Jacob. I may have, have waited for somebody else to come along. But tonight we're going to read, and we're going to start reading about the stories concerning Jacob. Because <laughs> Jacob is a very important person. He eventually becomes Israel. He eventually has his name changed to Israel. And Israel, Jacob means a trickster, means a con man. Israel means a prince of God. So as we read these stories in these next several chapters about Jacob, we're going to see the transition from this, this trickster to somebody who would be the father of the tribes of the faithful. Okay? So we want to start back in chapter 27 in verse 41. Now the story, as the story goes, uh, Jacob had just stole the, the, the blessing. From Esau, okay? In the verse 41 it says this, And Esau hated Jacob. And we could understand why. Esau got the blessing stole off of him. Even though he didn't think it was important when he sold his birthright, he didn't think it was all that great, but he had it stolen off of him. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand, my dad's getting old and he's going to pass away pretty soon. After they're done, I will slay my brother Jacob. Esau had it out for Jacob. He says, I'm going to take care of him. And these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. Now if you remember, if you go back a little bit, Isaac loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Isaac, you know, Esau was his, his father's boy. But Jacob was his mama's boy, okay? So when Rebekah heard this, when she, she sent and she called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, your brother Esau as touching thee does comfort himself, proposing to kill thee. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice and arise. Flee thou to Laban, my brother, in, uh, to Haran. If you would go back to where Abraham sent his servant to get a bride for Isaac, that's where he went. He went back to Haran. That was his hometown. And he went back to his, his family. Uh, so Rebecca is telling Jacob, go back to, to your uncle Laban, my brother, who's alive there. He says, and tarry with him a few days. Now, <laughs> they probably figured, you know, go back for a little while and, you know, let Esau kind of cool off a little bit. They didn't realize, we know the story, he went back there for 20 years. It wasn't a, full, it wasn't a few days. It wasn't just a short time. They thought it was going to be. They had in their mind that you know, he was just going to get out of the picture for a little while and come back. But it turned into a 20-year trip, and we'll read about that as we go on through the chapters. He says, Tarry with him a few days until your brother's fury turn away, until your brother's anger turn away from you, and he forget that which you have done to him. Then I will send and fetch you from thence. Why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? Okay, so verse 46. 
And Rebecca said to Isaac, and isn't it an interesting, I think Jacob got his, the way he was from Rebecca because she's changing her story up here a little bit with Isaac. And she's saying one thing to Jacob and one thing to Isaac. Rebecca said to Isaac, I'm weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. Those are the daughters, the Canaanite women that Esau married, that we talked about before. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? So uh, he, she says one thing to Jacob, and she says another thing to Isaac. She says, we need, we need to send Jacob back, to, you know, back home so he can get a bride from our family, just like you got me. So that sets the, the, the scene here of the stories about Jacob. In chapter 28, it says this. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. Now, he had already blessed him. Jacob had already told a blessing. But now we see Isaac confirming that Jacob would be the one who would bear the covenant promise that God gave to Abraham. He would be the one through whom the line of Messiah would come. Okay? Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, You shall not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee away from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. He's saying, I want you to go back, go back to where your mother came from, and I want you to find a wife there. Okay? Now, it was a little different back then. They didn't have, you know, match, I match on the internet back then. They had to... They did things a little differently. Okay, they did things. They probably, I don't know, maybe they did them a little better. But we, we read about when uh, Isaac, you know, when, when, when Rebecca came, he had never seen her. He had, had been already prearranged before he ever, even ever knew who he was going to marry. As it turned out, he liked her. But it was, that's the way they did things back then. The marriages would be arranged. They didn't have, you know, they wouldn't like go on a date. They would just, you know, anyway, all right. It's a different, different topic. <laughs> Isaac goes on and he says this. He says, And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayst be a multitude of people, and give thee the, bless the blessing of Abraham. Jacob is, or Isaac is recognizing that Jacob would be the one. He's pronouncing Abraham's blessing, the covenant blessing. This is like covenant language that we're reading here. He says, That thou mayst inherit the land, wherein thou art a stranger which God gave unto Abraham. And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Padan Aram unto Laban, son of Bethuel the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. So here's Jacob. Now you've got to get this in your mind. Jacob, the blessing is his. The land is his, according to, by faith, according to what Jacob had, or Isaac had pronounced and what God had told to Abraham. He's bearing the blessing of Abraham. But he's fleeing the land that's supposed to be his. Now here's Jacob. He was not a man of the field. He wasn't used to living and sleeping out in the wild. He wasn't a hunter. He never really fended for himself. He was a mama boy. He stayed at home. But now he's on his own. And he's traveling to a place he'd never been. And he's going through lands that he had never seen. He's just He's just going. They probably gave him directions of how to get to where he had to get. And he's, just, he's, he's out on his own for the first time in his life. He was not prepared for this. But he's traveling. He's not used to fending for himself. He, he had absolutely no idea what was awaiting him. He just knew the command that his dad had given him. He knew the blessing that his father had spoken on him. Okay? Let's look at verse 6. Well, let's, let's drop down to verse 10. Because verses 6 through 9 deals with Esau. Esau figured, well, you know, maybe I better find me a wife of the family <laughs> because he had already, you know, he had already uh, lost his blessing. But anyway, that's, look at verse 10. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and he tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. This certain place was more than likely a place very near the place where Abraham first built an altar. Do you remember when we uh, were reading about when Abraham or Abram was first called from Ur of the Chaldees? 
and he spent some time in Haran, and then he, and he came to the, went to the, what would be the Promised Land. He built an altar. This is probably very near where the altar was built. Some people say that some of the stones that he might have put his head on might have been stones from that first altar that Abraham built. That's just, you know, kind of conjecture. But it was in that area. It was in that place. And it said he came to this certain place, and I don't believe there's any coincidence that it was in that place. And he laid down, and he's sleeping. And again, here's this young man who is on his way to a place he's never been, and he doesn't know what's going to go on. He doesn't know what's going to happen. You talk about uncertainty. And we were talking about Sister Shana got on a plane yesterday and flew to... Uh, you know, San Antonio. There's uncertainty there. Well, Jacob, he was, this is certainly uncertainty. He didn't know what was going on. And it says in verse 12 that he dreamed a dream. And behold, a ladder set on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, in these verses, we see the word behold like four times. So this is something, this is a very important saying, look, Pay attention. Check this out. Look what happened to Jacob. This rascal, this, 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 uh, you might call him a con man. He fell asleep and he had a dream. And it was a dream that came from God. He had an encounter. The first time recorded and probably the first time in his life that he had a face-to-face -face personal encounter with the God of his forefather Abraham. Look what it says in verse 12. And he dreamed a dream, and behold, there was a ladder, or, or a stairway, okay, a stairway, set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. This ladder came from earth to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. The angels, the messengers of God, were going up and down this staircase. And behold, the Lord stood above it. So you just get this picture that Abram had in his dream. This place from earth to heaven, God uh, above the staircase and the angels coming and going. It's like, it's like a picture of what happens when we send our prayers up and the angels take them up and God sends his blessings down. We see this happening in... Jacob's dream. It says, The Lord stood above it, and he said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it. Now, now he's speaking directly to Jacob. He's speaking covenant, where the same things he said when he made the covenant with Abraham is what he's saying now to the bearer of the promise. The promise that he made to Abraham. He's saying, you see this land, it's yours. And it belongs to your seed. It's yours. He was running from it. He was going to another land. He was going back to where his mom grew up. But God wanted him to know that no matter what the future held, Jacob did not know what was, going, what was going to happen tomorrow or a week later or a year later or 20 years later. But God wanted him to know that no matter what was going to happen next week or next month or next year, the land was his. He confirmed his promise. You know, if God gives you a promise, he's going to keep it. He's going to keep it. And even though you might find yourself as far away from that promise as you can imagine, he's still going to keep it. If God gave you a promise, he's going to keep it. He assured Jacob. Jacob didn't know what was going to happen. God knew. God knew he was going to go and stay with his uncle Laban. And Laban would put Jacob to shame when it came to it. <laughs> Laban knew how to, he knew how to turn a page. He really did. So, so God knew what Jacob was up against. So he told him, he assured him, he says, this land is yours. You're going to be back. Jacob thought it was just going to be a few days. God knew it was going to be 20 years. He told him, he said, that the land where on you lie, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. In verse 14, and your seed shall be as the dust of the earth, 
And thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. The same promise he made to Abraham is the same promise he's making to Jacob. Because Jacob is in the line. We know that Jacob became Israel. And the children of Israel, the twelve tribes of Israel, are promised by God to be a blessing to all the earth. We know that Christ came through the tribe of Judah. That God blessed us by giving us Messiah through Israel. But we also believe that God's promises to Israel are without repentance. And God is going to keep his promises even though we see them back in their land in unbelief, even though we see the rest of the world coming against them, most of the world thinks that Israel is a curse. But as God is going to show what a blessing he's going to be, because when Messiah returns, it's going to be to the nation of Israel. The blessing to the world is through the coming of the Messiah, through the people of Israel. He's saying, Jacob, you're going to be a blessing. In you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. In, a in Jacob, right then and there, within his body was the, was the planting of the seed of the nation of Israel. He goes on and he says, And behold, I'm with you, and I'll keep you in all places wherever you go. When you go stay with your Uncle Laban, I'm going to be with you. When your Uncle Laban rips you off and lies to you and, and, and substitutes one daughter for the other, I'm, I'm going to be with you. When you find yourself running from him, I'm going to be with you. When you find yourself coming back to the land and your brother Esau is going to come and you think he's going to kill you, I'm going to be with you. No matter what is going to go on in these next five years, ten years, twenty years, for the rest of your life, Jacob, I'm going to be with you. God wants you to understand, Jesus said this to his disciples, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Those disciples, when Jesus said that at the very end of uh, Matthew's Gospel and toward before his ascension, when Jesus told, told that to his disciples, they had no clue of what they were going to deal with. When Jesus calls us, we, we don't have a clue of what's going to happen next week, next month, next year. We don't know what's going to happen, but we know this much. Whatever happens, he's with us. Yahweh is for us. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the creator of heaven and earth, the Messiah, the righteous branch. He's with us. He's for us. We might be struggling through horrible things right now, terrible struggles in this planet. God is for us. And ultimately, and ultimately, His promises will be manifest to us in a very real way. He says, I'm with you, in verse 15, and I'll keep you in all places where you go. And I'll bring you again into this land, for I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. What a promise. What a promise. God knew what was coming. God knew what was going to happen in Jacob's life. And he wanted to confirm in him. He wanted to let him know beyond any shadow of a doubt that no matter what he was going to face, he was going to be with him. Why? Because Jacob was such a great guy, he wasn't. Jacob was a trickster. He was a sharpie. He was a con man. He had to be changed. And as we read through these next several chapters, we're going to see the transformation from trickster, supplanter, con man to a prince of God. That's what Israel means. A prince of God. What about your transformation? What were you before you were saved? And where are you headed? See, it's, it's a transforming process. You read what Jacob had to go through for 20-some years. What have you gone through? It's a transforming process. I'm thankful that I didn't have to make myself right before I came to Christ. I'm thankful that I didn't have to make things, I didn't have to get myself perfect before I came to Jesus. I have never come. Some folks think that. They say, well, I ain't going to church until I get things right. They'll never come to church. You never get things right. But if you have faith to believe, and we're going to see as we read on here a little bit more, that Jacob, 
When he heard this, he believed what God had to say. You know, I'm, I'm, I wish sometimes that salvation, when I got saved, I wish it would have been like an instant transformation into like the perfect individual, you know. That would have been nice, wouldn't it? But I guess we'd never learn how, about God's mercy if that were the case. Okay, now, he has this dream. God tells him, he says, I'm going to give you the land. He speaks covenant language to him. I'm going to give you the land like I promised Abraham. Everything I promised Abraham, I'm going to do through you. You're going to have, you're going to have children, and they're going to populate. They're going to be to the north and to the south and east and west. It's going to be like the sand of the sea and stars in the sky. You can't number them. They're going to be everywhere, and they're going to be a blessing to the world. I'm going to give you this land, and I'll never leave you. What great promises. What great promises. I'm going to use you, I'm going to bless you, and I'll never leave you. Okay? Now, look at verse 16. And Jacob woke up. And he said, Surely Yahweh is here. He had heard about him before. He heard about the promises. I'm sure growing up at Isaac, instructed his children about the promises that God made to Abraham and to Isaac and about he, he heard that from his dad he might have heard it from his mom he might have heard it growing up but now he's heard it directly from the mouth of the Lord Jacob realized he said the Lord is here look at his response and, and when we're reading this and we see these Old Testament people you know we're no different than them we're no different than them when we have an encounter with the Holy One of Israel, we ought to have a response. Look at his response. He woke up and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. When I got here, I didn't know where I was. But now I realize I'm in a place. He had worship. He had commitment, fear, and reverence. This is the first place in the Bible where it, 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 it indicates uh, a place of worship, almost like a, a shrine or an altar. He said, I know he's in this place. I didn't know it before, but I know it now. Verse 17, and he was afraid. Jacob, when he realized who he had just heard from, he, he had fear. He said, man, I just heard from God. I just heard from Yahweh. I just heard from the Creator. I heard about Him all these years, but now I actually heard His voice. Man, do you remember the first time you ever heard God? I'm not, maybe, maybe you never heard His audible voice, but do you remember the first time you ever encountered God for real? You grow up hearing about Him, but what about that first time you felt His presence? First time you realized He was there, He was real. And he cared about you. Jacob said, man, he says, how dreadful is this place? This is a heavy, it's a heavy thing to, to come face to face, to hear the voice of God. He says, this is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. An entrance, an acceptance, the house of God, the place where God dwells. And, in, and a way to be accepted to the, to the heavenly place. How do we get to heaven? You know, there's that song, Stairway to Heaven, you know. Remember that song? Some of you young enough to remember that song. Stairway to Heaven. They didn't know what the stairway to heaven was. That song's all mixed up. The stairway to heaven is through Jesus Christ. He came in contact with the Messiah, the pre-incarnate Christ of Israel. And he says, it says in verse 18. Listen, look at his response. And Jacob rose up early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put for his pillows, and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon it. He exercised, he had reverence and remembrance. He set up a place, a, a remembering place. Do you remember when you first got saved? 
Can you, you know, I, I believe every, every one of us, I can remember when I first got saved, I don't remember the date, but I remember the place, I remember, I remember where it was and what happened when I first encountered God. I could take you to that place, I didn't set a stone up, but there is a place, it will always be in my memory where I was and what had happened. It's always that, that first encounter, that first one-on-one -on -one personal encounter with the Holy One of Israel. You never forget it. He set up a stone and he poured oil on it as like an anointing, as a worship. It says in verse 19, And he called the name of the place Bethel, which means house of God. The house of God. There wasn't a building there. It was out in the open. There wasn't a shrine there or a temple. But it was the house of God. It was the place where he met God and had access to the Holy One of Israel for the first time. This trickster, this, this con man, heard from God. Verse 20. Now look what he did. See if this, see if this reminds you of your experience with Christ. And Jacob vowed a vow. See, when I, you know, when I first, when I first, con when I came, first came in contact with the Lord, I remember telling him, I said, Lord, I said, if you show me you're real, then I'll, then I'll, okay, I'll serve you. I didn't know. I had no clue what I was saying. I didn't, I, I mean, I knew what I was saying, but I did not know what it entailed. I said, if you show me you're real, okay, I've been hearing all these people tell me about you, and I've been thinking, ah, uh, and when he showed me he was real, I said, okay, all right, okay. I was kind of stubborn. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like a skeptic at heart, but he convinced me. Like he convinced Jacob. This con man, listen to what he said. Jacob vowed a vow. He made a promise. And he said, if God will be with me, see, see, see if this sounds familiar. If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. He said, all right, Lord. You've made me your promise. I'm going to hold you to your promise. Okay, Lord. You're going to be with me. You're going to bring me back here. And as we go on through these stories, we're going to see how Jacob learned firsthand about God's provision and how God can make a way. Have you ever made a vow to God? And I'm not talking... Some of these people talk about making vows and giving money. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about Jacob is saying, listen, I'm yours. If this is true, if you're going to keep me, if you're going to provide for me, if you're going to do all these things that you promised you're going to do for me, if you're going to bring me back here, I'm yours. And one thing that's really interesting, when we, as we read these stories, the, the, the Jacob stories are like bookmarked. Okay? They're bookmarked. At the beginning, we hear about a nighttime encounter with the Lord through a dream. Toward the end of his time with Laban, when he's coming back, what happened? There's a nighttime encounter with the Lord in a wrestling match. Huh? You know the story? We're not there yet. We'll get there in a few weeks. But there's a nighttime encounter with the Lord with a wrestling match. Here God promised him, and there God changed his name. After 20 years of fighting and battling to get what he wanted, to get his, to get his lovely Rachel, he got stuck with Leah the <laughs> first time through, but to get his Rachel and to get, to, get his, to get his flocks. On the way back, when he heard Esau was coming for him, he thought, oh man, he's, he got scared. And he wrestled with God at Peniel at the brook. The beginning and the ending of his time away from the promised land are bookmarked by encounters with God. The first time God promised him, the second time God changed him. Changed his name from Jacob, con man, to prince of God. Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on. God, if you're going to take care of me, 
so that I come again to my father's house. If you're going to bring me back here like you promised, then Yahweh will be my Elohim. Yahweh will be my God. I'll serve him. I'll worship him. He'll be the one. He'll be the only one I serve. And this stone, he says, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house, Bethel. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. I'll worship you with my stuff. I want to ask you this. When we talk about the house of God, what are we talking about today in the New Testament? We're not talking about this building. You know, it is it's God's house. It's a church. And it's just a building. But the house of the Lord is this. This is where the Holy Spirit dwells. This is where, this is, this is Bethel. Right here. If God is living inside of you. See, one thing that we, one blessing that we have as New Testament Christians. We know things that they didn't know. Because things have been revealed to us in the New Testament about God's purpose and plan. They knew what God's purpose was. They knew about you know, the blessing to the world and so forth. But God has revealed himself in the fullness in the person of Jesus Christ. So we know all things. We've heard from God. We've received the indwelling Holy Spirit that teaches us all things. How much more? You know, we've talked earlier, we were saying, somebody was saying how so many people are going through so many things right now. You know what? If God made you a promise. If you're His, the promise is He has a place for you. He has blessing for you. And He'll never leave you. He'll never leave you. You might have been a con man. You might have been a troublemaker. You might have been, you know, I was a troublemaker before I was saved. I was sharing with Sister Clara, uh, Jairus' wife, you know, she's a teacher. I said, you didn't want me. I said, <laughs> when I was in school, <laughs> them teachers didn't want me in their class. I was a troublemaker. I was. Some people think I still am. I'm not. He's a troublemaker. But God took that con man. And even, even before the change, the promises were there. You know why? Because God knew him before he was born. And we get sometimes into, into areas that are so, that are kind of beyond my understanding. Why Esau and Jacob? Did God, and this is what I believe, God knew the choices they would make. I don't believe God decided, well, Esau's going to be like this and Jacob's going to be like this. But God knew the way they were going to be. So his choices were made according to, the, to their reaction, to what they, were, what they would do. Do you know God knew that there would come a time when you would make a choice to follow him? He didn't make you do that. If that was the case, we'd just be robots. But he knew the choices we would make, even though we, were, we might have been rascals. God knew us. He knew us when we were still in our mother's womb. Just like with Jacob. These next few weeks, we're going to read about Jacob and his experience with his uncle Laban. And we're going to see the transformation from a con man to a prince of God. From somebody who was running for his life to someone to whom would be the promises that were given to Abraham, the covenant promises. Amen? Amen. Anybody have any questions or comments before we close tonight? Didn't keep you too long tonight. Okay. Any comments at all or questions? I'm so glad that God is merciful. I'm glad that God is faithful. I'm glad that when God looks at us, he doesn't look at what we are, but he looks at what we can be. Looks at what he wants us to be. Amen? I want to tell you this much, too. I'm, I am going to close. For those people that you think are so far gone, you keep praying for them. Keep praying for them. 
for those people that have despitefully used you, that you think they could never be saved. Keep praying for them. If God can save Jacob, who couldn't he save? God could save, God could save alcoholics. God could save drug addicts. God could save addicts of all kinds. God could save, God could save sex addicts. There's nobody that's beyond God's ability to save and restore and renew and make new. Nobody that's beyond that. I think in, you know, just this, this Saturday we're going to be out and, you know, with some hot dogs and with kids and everything. And it, it might be, every time we do that, you always get one or two folks that come up and you think, man, God will never save them. I want to tell you something. Sometimes they could be the best preachers. <laughs> they can. Amen.